we're here, we're good. Go figure that. Are you kidding? Hey, we're good. Welcome to the Council of Time. I know I'm a bit late. Technical difficulties there. I guess the title of the show again, of this broadcast, was not befitting. Was not been befitting. Anyway, we're going to carry on. Title of this broadcast is, Do I Serve a System? Do I Serve a System? Oh boy, might want to bring out your notes on this one. Last night in the other broadcast. By the way, all of this prefaces the Holy Spirit. You guys know that? All of it does. Every single last bit of it. And before we start in Acts chapter 2, there are some qualifications we must have as the disciples also had. Okay? So then there are some things that need to be defined. Hmm. Things that need to be defined. I, I can tell you this, there, there are some things I could tell you. But you need to know what is up against you, what is the nature of this world in the first place. That's what we said last night, so why do people have to suffer? Or do they have to suffer at all? Right? Why is it, why all this bad stuff? Why is it happening in the world when God is in absolute control? Those things deserve to be clarified, don't they? You have to understand it. You just can't give it a blanket statement. They have to be understood. They have to be understood that you walk in truth, understanding your purpose. I mean, not just guessing about your purpose or saying, well, that purpose could be true. Forget about the could be truths. We're not here to learn theory, but to partake of our Father. And in him is what? The spirit of truth. He is truly Lord of our lives. Right? He's in control of our lives. Is he not? Or is he? Is he? Is he in control of your life? Or not? Hmm? So we're going to do some scripture hopping. So that we can see some things tonight. We, we began talking about this guy, Satan, not to edify him. Right? Because the Lord said he would not have you ignorant concerning the devices of the enemy. Devices, as we looked into, are, are, are plots and plans of the enemy. Which originate where? In the mind. They do. And so if they originate in the mind, right? I want you to think of your life. Most of your life, your effort has been spent in thought. Within imagination, within what could be. Within things that have not come out the way you thought they would. You have worried about things that could be, not things that are. When something is, you deal with it. You don't worry about it. You worry about the unknown. We spent our time in the unknown. Something that was not determined. Hmm? Think about it, folks. Think about it. Think about it. So then, the nature of this guy, so that you don't fall prey to him, don't you think you ought to know that? Because it goes with the system you serve. Are you serving a system at all? How many of you think you're not serving a system? How many? How many of you have a question? You, you, you could be serving a system you shouldn't be serving. How many have split loyalties? How many? How many do that? And all these things are things that have to be defined. You have to know who the, your opponent is, who the opposer is. It's in every title of his name. Every title every single title. Boy, isn't this funny, guys? Now, listen. I, it, it, you start talking about this subject, right? Now, why would this subject be interruptible? I'll tell you why. Just like the other night. Just like last night. There's no surfacing of the darkness. When you start to shed light on the darkness, just like in the Bible, it says that man will narrowly look upon him and say, is this the man... That ruled the nations and had them, I'm paraphrasing, had them fearful, shaking in their boots. Are you kidding? Is this the man that did this? This is what people will look upon Satan and say, is this the man? Is that the man? Really? 
and they will narrowly look upon him. That's looking at someone through the corner of your eye in disbelief. Like, oh, no, no, are you serious? Not that. Really? That? Right there, that. Temperature? No, not that. That's how they will look upon Satan, who has deceived them, of whom they do serve. The question is, do you serve Lucifer in any capacity? Do you? Do you serve the devil in any capacity? Your flesh is going to squirm this evening. It's going to squirm. It's going to wiggle and squirm. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's not going to be one of those happy, joyful moments, but there will be some type, there will be a revelation in this. But the question is again, have you served the devil in any capacity? Not in some capacity, in any capacity. Do you know why God is perfect? Do you know why God is perfect? You're going to see that tonight too. What is that? God is perfect. Huh? You're going to see that. That God is in fact perfect. And the fruit of God is in fact perfect. And he requires us to bring forth perfect fruit. So that word perfect must be defined by his truth, which cannot be done on the surface. It's a revelation that is incredibly simple. So we're going to start going into this. We did talk this morning about something. Jesus left this world, didn't he? How many of you know Jesus left this world? We also talked about this, that Satan is the ruler of this world, of these kingdoms. Why is he the ruler of this world? Why is he called the ruler of this world? Why is he called that? Can we look into some uh, scriptures? John fourteen thirty. When Jesus says, here and after, I will not talk, uh, talk with you much more. I'm not going to talk with you much more. For the prince of this world cometh, and he hath nothing in me. That's what Jesus said. The prince of this world cometh. Do you remember in the time of the temptations, Satan showed Jesus all the kingdoms in a moment of time. He said, all these I'll give to you if you bow down and worship me. Because they were given to, they are mine. They were given to me. And I can give them to whomever I will. Hmm? Stay with me now. Satan said to Jesus, I can give these kingdoms to whomever I will. He showed Jesus what the kingdoms of the earth. The kingdoms of the earth, not any other kingdoms, the kingdoms of this earth, in a moment of time, they were given to him. They are his kingdoms. In the book of Daniel, it shows you all the kingdoms of earth until the everlasting kingdom comes in. It, during the temptations of Christ, it was named that all these kingdoms are whose? The devil's. The devils. Jesus confirms it by saying, Here and after I will not talk with you, with you much more, for the prince of the world cometh. He confirms it, prince of the world. That's not the only place he was called the ruler of this world. Hmm? In John 16, 7 the, uh, through 11, you can read that the prince of the world is judged. Is this throwing anybody off? Anybody thrown off? Kind of make you sick to your stomach. Some of you, I know it does. Because you know where I'm going with this. Well, we have to go there. Some people know exactly where I'm going with this. We have to go there. Truth is truth. It is true. Truth is truth. That word, when it says Satan is judged, let's clarify that, can we? The prince of the world is judged. Let's go to John 16 real quick. 
Can we do that? John 16. Let's go read it. Let's read it so we can get some context. John 16. Here we go. John 16. We're going to start at 7. Jesus says, Nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. He's going to reprove what? The world of sin. Now, keep that in mind. The world of sin and of righteousness. He's going to reprove what? The world of sin and of righteousness. Well, how can you have a world of sin and a world of righteousness? How can that? Because it says, he will reprove the world of sin. The world of sin and of righteousness. But the qualifier was left off. So the world of sin and the world of righteousness and the world of judgment. Then he qualifies it all. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness. Now you see how that happens? He didn't say the world of sin because they believe not on me. He said of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. What is he saying there? He said, uh, he, the Holy Spirit, will reprove the world of sin. So in this context, what is that world, what is that word world used for us? What I want you to see. World. Hmm? What is it? Don't go jumping to, to, to uh, 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 cosmos. You know what that's what it is? Cosmos. The the um, isn't that the Greek word for it? Cosmos. K o s m o s. Cosmos. Sound familiar? Cosmos. World. Cosmos. You know why they chose cosmos like that? That came from Greek. That came from the Grecians. Cosmos. Here, the context of the word is cosmos. K o s m o s. Don't you find that strange? Right? So what are we looking at? We're looking at a broad base. We're looking at a habitation, is what we're looking at. We're looking at a habitation with elements. Just like the cosmos. A habitation with elements, just like the cosmos. Not so much the earth. Right? It did not say the earth. It said the world. And when the world, wor when, when world is used, the world of something is the habitation of something with the elements. The world of sin includes the kingdoms of sin. It includes darkness and the elements in those kingdoms and of that darkness. The world of sin, the world of righteousness. Now, why would the Holy Spirit reprove? How many of you know what that word reprove means? You have to define these things, or you won't know it. That is to simply, to, to reprove, let's say to reprove, is to fortify by way of making known. So you could take that word reprove, and use prove. Just take the, the, you can say prove. And when he comes, he will prove the world of sin. He will prove the world of righteousness. And he will prove the world of judgment. He's going to prove it. See that word reprove. Where do you think prove came from in the first place? Hmm? Where do you think it came from? Prove. All of our English words do not come from the English. They come from other cultures. They come from many other cultures, mingled into one specific language called English. So we take root words and suffixes and prefixes and we came up with a different, di a different language which is called English. English is not the root of itself, but the root of English is Grecian, Roman, Egyptian, you just, you name it, it's in there. That's what it is. 
All right? You guys swallow that in John 16, 8. I've got to do something for about 10 minutes. I'll be right back. Can you guys hold on for 10 minutes? I'm going to play some music. I'm going to be back in 10 minutes, okay? Some very soft music. You guys bear with me. Sorry about this interruption, but it was expected. 10 minutes. Give me 10 minutes. I'll be right back. We are back. Again, I am back. I am back. I am back. That was, uh, man, well, it was a little longer than I thought. I do apologize. Let's get rolling, shall we? Let me pull this. Uh, looks like my screen disappeared. We're going to get rolling. By the way, hope you guys aren't bored during this discussion. Where we were, where we were, the goal of this topic is that you understand if you're, and that you know if you're where you are, what you're serving, so that you can actually overcome the devil. You see, Christ has overcome Satan. But all too often, a person does not know how to overcome him. Therefore, they're almost mind-locked into this guy, into his characteristics. Even those who come against you and they say certain things, as I'm telling you now, don't focus on them. Don't ever focus on them. You're wasting your time. You really are. You're sent to those to speak to those who would hear, and you're for them, or to stand as a witness against those who are not here. In either case... In either case, you're not sent to those who oppose you that you may carry the dust and the residue of them back home where you are. And if they are in your home, you're there to fight on behalf of that person you're fighting for life or death. Right? You're fighting for life or death. It's life or death. It's life or death. Right? Whether Wherever you are, it doesn't matter. Wherever you go, it does not matter. It, and we're going to define that. But first, so, so we were talking about the dragon. Th that guy. We're talking about the dragon, that guy. Now we're going to put some things in context. We're talking about the dragon. The, the, uh, the, he, the prince of demons. Right? The father of lies. Father of lies. I'm going to read that to you, John 8, 44. Very interesting. The devourer. Right? Doesn't he devour? And we're talking about kingdoms. Because the, the question is this. Do you serve? Do you serve a system? Do you serve a system? That's what we're going to discuss. That's the ultimate goal of this conversation. Is to get you to see, do you serve a system? And, and by doing so, do you, do you in any way, form or fashion, serve Lucifer? Are you being of good service to Lucifer? I hope not, but it needs to be found out that we may rid ourselves of it. The beauty of our Lord is this. He has granted us grace and mercy, time to repent. He has granted us time to repent. If it didn't take time to repent, he would not have granted humanity time. It takes time to repent. Why? It takes time that you walk through multiple situations to learn exactly what you're doing. To see the filth of your own ways, not somebody else's ways, yours. We're going to get into accusers, uh, but, 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 let's establish something. Jesus in John 14.30, which is where we are, right? Or, or, or we actually went to, did we go to John 16? When Jesus says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth is that it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I, for if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, why will the comforter not come to you? When, why would the comforter, why didn't the comforter come when Jesus was here? And why? And then he says, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. Who's going to do it? Jesus? No. That's not what Jesus is speaking in John 16. And what does he say? What does he say? When he departs, he will send the comforter to you. And Jesus says, and when he comes, he will reprove the world of sin. You guys following me? Before you comment, just are you following me? John 16, 8 is where I'm, in, where I'm at. And when he comes, he will reprove the world of sin. Well, wait a minute. 
Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hey, can anybody see the Holy Spirit? No. Does the world recognize the Holy Spirit? No. So then, how can the Holy Spirit reprove the world of sin to those that cannot see nor hear Him? How is it done? Can you answer that? How is it done? How is it done when the world denies you as being a Christian? They deny Jesus, they deny God, they deny the Holy Spirit, they deny everything except those things that are within the systems of the world already. How can that be done? There you go. Through us. See, now I'm getting excited. See, because you're about to learn a part of your purpose. You're going to learn. You're going to learn. I'm getting real excited. You know why this is called freedom. See, a person is bound when they're guessing, well, what am I here for? What am I supposed to do? And things aren't turning out right. You're bound. You can't do anything. You can't move left or right. You're always going to go back home left with that decision. What am I supposed to do? All things are being clarified now. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. See, some of you know exactly where I'm going. He's going to reprove the world of righteousness. He's going to reprove the world of judgment. He'll make it known. He's going to prove it. And surely he did through us. Listen to what he did. He, you, you, this is so amazing. When you were in sin, you didn't know it. You didn't know you were in a world of sin until you came to Christ. And when you came to Christ, after you repented of the one thing and you accepted him as your personal savior, he began to add to you things. And then one day, one special moment, the Holy Spirit convicted you in your heart. You laid your whole life down. See, you were called to the altar for salvation at one point. But there was another point where you came to him by yourself on your own and you laid it all down with tears. Because the Lord gave you a revelation. And at that time, you truly did something. Then the Holy Spirit came within you. And you looked back at the world and you said, that world is full of sin. How can they be saved? Lord, send me to work. That was the third stage. The first stage, you went to the altar. You heard the call. You responded. Second stage is when you laid everything down in your secret place, in the place of your own home, wherever it was. The third stage is when he began to open your eyes and you looked in the world and you said, how can I help them? Put me to work. That's what you said. Put me to work. I'm going to work for you, Lord. Put me to work for the kingdom. Hmm? Don't you notice that? Why? Because in that eye-opening experience, when you partook of the Holy Spirit, and you probably did not know it, he proved to you the world of sin and you saw your brothers and your sisters in danger. Some of you see that now. He showed you a world of righteousness which are the ways of Christ and of judgment because the prince of the world is judged. Now in John 16, 11, the prince, because the prince of the world is judged? Well, let's define this, please, shall we? If someone is judged and pronounced guilty, what happens then? They're locked away, locked up, aren't they? Aren't they? Aren't they locked away, locked up? See, this is why, they, and, and I have to tell you this, I know you guys go to Greek and, and dictionaries and things of that nature, right? But, see, I have to have the context of everything because I am super nosy. Super nosy. So if he is judged, Jesus said something else that I shared with you the other day. Jesus said, now the prince of this world is cast down. He is cast down. Here you hear Jesus say. You hear him say. Because the prince of the world is judged. Judged. He lost his placement. Where, did he, where was he cast down to? The earth. Revelation. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea.
for the devil has come down to you. And he's angry. He's in wrath. Because he knows he has but a short time. When Jesus died at the cross, Satan lost his placement among the angels. Because listen, in the book of Job, wasn't he found among the angels? And God said, what's wrong with you? What was he doing up there in the first place? That implies his title. In the Old Testament, he had certain titles. In the New Testament, he had different titles. That's why you hear all these different names, different titles, implying different characteristics of him. Right? So then, I ask you this. Now, let's read one more thing. Let's read one more thing. So you know that part, right? The Holy Spirit will reprove all those things, righteousness, the world, the world of sin and judgment through who? You. Through you, whom the world can see. You start to see your placement. The world can't see the Holy Spirit, but the world can see you. Uh oh, that means your reputation, your representation of the gospel of Jesus Christ is critical. That means your life is a demonstration of the things of God to the unbeliever. Because you're the closest thing they see to the kingdom of God. Which means if you're a representative, here, here's the deal. If you're a representative of the kingdom, why in the world are you still living your life for yourself? If they are looking at you, and if they will be judged, and you're part of it because they saw you, whatever you do, you either allow them to function by, or you condemn it by yourselves not doing it. Are you authorizing them out there? Are you authorizing them to sin? Because if the Holy Spirit comes from the Father of lights, through Christ, directly to you, you are in fact the ambassador. It is your purpose in this earth to stand that way. And you are the one authorizing or not authorizing. So who's going to be punished? The sinner? Or those who have been chosen and selected as ambassadors to Christ when they go astray? Did you ever think about that? When you said, Lord, I give my life to you, did you say that from the heart? Did you really mean that? No, because in most cases, we keep our agendas our ways. We, we are crafty. We do things for our edification to place us on a pedestal. That's why we get in arguments. The truth is, if one did not live for themselves, no one would argue. Because the one that's an ambassador to Christ will always give way because they would have wisdom. You wouldn't argue with a child of Lucifer. And I'm going to qualify that too. A child of Lucifer. We're speaking nothing of flesh here. A child of Lucifer. You thought it was flesh. That's not so. A child of Lucifer. I, I suggest you, Lucifer, has many children. Many. And it's very simple. And I ask you again, I ask you again, have you in any way, form, or fashion been in servitude to Satan? Because here it comes. Now, now it's, this isn't a message of condemnation. This is one of those aha moments. Let me move away. Thank you, Lord, for showing me that. Thank you, Lord, for showing me that, because I'm not the one that's going to tell you. The Lord is. By what he already established. You see, it's already established. So now, to understand if you have been a servant of Lucifer, we need to examine something. We already know that Jesus went away and the Holy Spirit can come. I didn't even finish that. Why did Jesus have to go away for the Holy Spirit to come? Here it comes. You know why? He said, he said, if he does not go away, the comforter will not come. Why? 
Why? Because the comforter need not come when that same power is in Christ. And when Christ ascended to the right hand of God, that power can then be given to the children of the living God. The same power that worked through Christ is now within his children. The same setup, the same standard the only difference is our mind. The same authority, the same power, the same understanding, the same everything. The only difference is the mind. And I say the mind because your soul will either adopt the mind of flesh or the mind of Christ. Your soul will adopt or feed from either flesh or spirit. And you know what the word says about that? If you walk in the spirit, you, you walk, it was, a, it was told to us to walk in the spirit that we do not fulfill the nature of the flesh. Which means if you don't walk in the spirit, you will fulfill the nature of your flesh. And the nature of your flesh is sin and death. The nature of your flesh is darkness. Your flesh is kaput doomed and it will always crave you see that my my simple truth see that's why there's no there's no in between there's no in between because if you're not walking in the spirit you're fulfilling the nature of the flesh in fact you're going to find out something else about Christ. So it gives no slip room. There is no slip room. And some of you will just, you'll collapse your hands and say, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Because you will understand that you should have died by the wages of sin. But you didn't. Because of his grace and his mercy upon your life. You will fully understand that. Some of you will. Some of you. All right? So then, so then, he, Jesus says that comforter could not come while he was on earth. In fact, he said, you ought to be, you, you know, you, could be, you ought to be glad. Don't be hurt in your heart. You ought to be glad because the comforter is going to come. And when he comes, he's going to do things within you. He's going to do things. With, and sure enough, in the Acts of the Apostles, the Holy Spirit did come, which happens to be the Spirit of the living God. My goodness. Because Jesus, when he was in the earth, he said, I don't say anything of my own. I say what my Father gives me. He said, I and my Father are one. That's what he kept saying. He was talking to them about the Spirit that indwelled within that flesh. Not that his flesh was the Father. His flesh was the Son of Men. But his Spirit was of the Father. And if your spirit is of the Father, who are you operating by in the first place? He said, I and my Father are one. See, that throws people off. They get offended by that statement because they have no spiritual understanding of the truth. And the truth is, did not all things come from God? And if all things came from God and he spoke a word, was that not Christ? Christ being the word made flesh and dwelt among men. So Jesus being the word of God, God speaks his word. So the word of a man, is it not the man? Huh? My goodness. You see? Do you see? Do you see? Do you see? It is man who came up with the rest of this stuff. Causing people to argue, God is not the author of confusion. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Satan is the author of confusion. It is confusion with that very subject. There is clarity with the Father. In fact, you get that I don't care attitude. Somebody comes to you, well, do you think that God is one? Or that there are three different... You say, look, man, that is God's kingdom. I don't speak of those things I don't know. I may speak of those things I do know, and that has nothing to do with my salvation because I simply say yes to my Lord. He will show me in due time what the structure of the kingdom is. I'm not pressed to learn that. I'm pressed to do the will of God in the earth. How about that one? You tell him, look, 
Man, I have no time for that. I'm on assignment. And I must focus on what the Lord gave me. In due time, he will reveal all things to me. But I must work by those things he has already revealed. My father requires me to produce perfect fruit. So I have a job to do. I have no time to talk about those things neither one of us have seen. Hmm? So then, that same power. Hmm? That same power. That same power. Is it? Jesus said, I will not leave you alone. I'm not going to leave you by yourself. The Father is going to send you the comforter who comes in my name. You don't... See, I'm getting... I'm, I, see, you don't think you have the comforter. Wrong. Yes, you do. Oh, yes, you do. Because Jesus... What? The, it, Jesus, what? He will not lie. Why? Because the Father does not lie. It's already there in you. My, my. See, it's there in you. It's there in you. It's there in you. Now, the Comforter has a specific task within you. And we just read that in John 16. We just read that specific task that will be performed in you. It's kind of like when Jesus said, when Jesus was doing all those miracles, and he said, hey, wait, I didn't, I didn't come for this. I came to spread the good news. I didn't come for this. I came for the sake of the gospel, and then I'm gone. You didn't come for what, Jesus? All the healings and everything else are a byproduct of the word. Because you can heal all day, but if people don't get the word, they're going back to their original condition. You don't believe Jesus said that, do you? See, that's why you have to examine the word of God. Those small things like that put you back on course. Because most people will seek to go out there and do the miracles and do the healings and everything else. Right? What did Jesus say? He said they're going to go and stand before him. And they're going to say, well, Lord, didn't we heal in your name? Yes. Didn't we do so and so in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Yes, 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 yes. And Jesus at the end will say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Do you understand? They were pressed in life to do the workings of God in the earth through the name of Christ, and they did so. And Jesus in the end will tell them to depart, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Why would he say that? He said this. What you, he ended up saying, you didn't visit me in prison. When did we see you in prison? You didn't give me drink when I was thirsty. When did we see you thirsty? You didn't feed me when I was hungry. You didn't clothe me when I was naked. Well, when did we see you do in, in any of these positions? And Jesus tells them the key. What you've done to the least of these, you've also done unto me. So what does that mean? I'll tell you. If you're so focused on the healings and everything else, you're going to get tunnel vision. You may go out there and do that. But you will forsake what the Lord has placed before you to work in. Half of you forsake your family, who is who he has placed in your life, and you forsake them to go outside. Charity starts at home. You can't show that person over their love and not show your family love. You can forget it. That is hypocrisy. You cannot pick and choose who you want. You must be led. And as the Spirit wills, he will direct my mind. See, this puts everything, this dethrones man. It dethrones him. And then, guess what? The only way to truly follow Christ is with a full surrender. See, that fights pride in all cases, doesn't it? That kills pride. That, that, that just kills pride. Hmm? That's the end of that. That kills it. Man has made up their own missions. And I ask again. Have you or do you in any capacity serve Satan? Or well, we're going to find out. So two things we have discussed. Two things. Number one. Number one. 
the, the last one we just mentioned is one of the big ones. You, you are set up the same way Christ was in this earth. You are. And you had, you didn't do anything to get that. <clears throat> Salvation is a gift of God. If it's a gift, it's given to you. It was given to you because God had already chose you from the beginning and gave you to his son. And it is the will of God that Jesus not lose any of us. That does not mean some of us won't be lost. That simply implies the will of God. The intent of God. You didn't do anything. God chose you to come to his son. And if he chose you first, he's also placed a great responsibility on you to go and get those who are out there who came after you who need the Lord. Hmm? So you have a job to do. That same power that worked in Christ now works within you in the earth. You are absolutely purposeful. Purposeful. Jesus commissioned you to spread the good news. Another name for the good news is the gospel. The gospel means good news. Hmm? He said that, the good news. We also learned that the kingdoms of this world do not belong to God. Didn't we? You know, in Revelation it says, at a specific time, in fact, it says, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. It never said that before. In fact, Jesus called him the ruler of this world. Jesus called him the prince of this world. Jesus called him this. Paul called him the God of this world. What constitutes this world? Hmm? Is it not the stuff within the context of which you're speaking? Like the world of sin. What is the world of sin? What is the world of sin? And, and that word world comes from cosmos. Hmm? Cosmos in, in Greek. Cosmos. Isn't that funny? Just like we call the cosmos with a C cosmos. That world encompasses things and elements. With a context, world of sin implies sin. Uh, let's just call it an area of sin with other elements mixed into it. A big area. The world of righteousness is righteousness. The expanse, the area of righteousness with the elements of righteousness. The world is called the world and used in that context. Why though? Why? Well, here it is. It's where you use your sense, your common sense, something you already know. You ready? Now, in Revelation it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Right? But that's after quite a few things happened. That's after, after, not before. That's after, after, not before. The king of the world is Lucifer. Jesus said, Jesus said himself. Jesus said, the prince of the world cometh and hath nothing in me. Why did he have nothing in Christ? Because of the temptation. He could not get a hold of the flesh of Christ enough to have a grip on him. So guess what? Jesus said, Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of the world, of this world, cometh, and he hath nothing in me. He had nothing in him because he couldn't tempt him. He had nothing in him because Satan roams and walks around the world like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Whom he may devour, anybody he wants. Anybody he can get to, he's going to do. Right? Anybody who he may devour. Anybody he can find with loopholes, cracks, and everything else. Anybody not covered by the blood. Now, here's a big one. Here's a big one because here's the expanse of it. Here's the expanse. So then, these kingdoms of this world, who do they belong to? Who do they belong to? 
See, it's even in the book of Daniel. Somebody had tried to use an argument because they don't understand the context of what's being spoken. Who appointed King Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon? Who appointed King Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon? Who did that? Who appointed King Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon? God did. God did. Was Babylon God's kingdom? Was it God's kingdom? Was Babylon God's kingdom according to the book of Daniel? No, it wasn't. It was not God's kingdom. It was not God's kingdom. See, even he's, no, it was not God's kingdom. Mm -mm. No. Who built that kingdom? Man did. Man by whose influences? Not God's. They didn't build Babylon by God's influence, but God appointed the king. Why would he do something like that? Why would God appoint a king? Why would he interfere like that and appoint a king? See, that stumps a lot of people. Let me tell you why it stumps people. <clears throat> it stumps people because I know for a fact God's in control of all things. Right? Could God not wipe Satan away totally? Yes, he could. He could wipe Satan away. Could, not, could God destroy his creation and start a brand new one? Yes, he could. Yes, he could. Does God really need us? No, he does not. He doesn't. Could God wipe every demon away? Yes, he could. He absolutely could. Why won't he do it? Ah, see, that's a question. Why won't he do it? Why won't he end suffering? Why won't he do it? Isn't that what you ask yourself? Lord, why do I have to suffer like this? Like Job did. I said, why was I even born? And then Job got chewed out by God. God said, listen up, Sonny. You did not birth yourself. You exist because of me. I sent you here and you're questioning me. You are my creation. You can be plucked away into non-existence at any. He, he put fear in Job. Job said, oops. And then Job ended up saying, well, I'm just nothing. <laughs> That's what he said. If you go and read Job, he ended up saying, I'm just nothing. And you are the father. Job came to his senses so quick. And this was a man that was stripped of all things, not deserving any of it. You guys go through life. I don't deserve this. Job didn't either. Job went through sufferings you can't imagine. Nothing you have gone through is worse than Job. That's why he's in the Bible. And if Job maintained himself, so can you. We just choose not to. But when Job questioned why he was here, why was he born in the first place, God reminded him, you're not here for your own sake. You're here because I sent you here. Don't question what I send and what I do not send. You are here because I created you and sent you here for no other reason. Things exist because God has allowed them to exist and he is the creator of all things in the first place. He created the crooked serpent. Remember that? We went over that. He created the crooked serpent, the fleeing serpent. God did. That means he knew he was going to be crooked in the first place. And he was identifying, hey, I, I have created all things. And then we ask foolish questions. Why, God, are you letting this happen? Because when we do this, we do something very dangerous. We forget. All things can only exist by way of the word. Without the word, it cannot exist. All things were spoken to be in existence. Even before this earth was created, he spoke a word for his angels. Do you understand? All things exist by the word. The word, the word of God says that speaking of Christ being the word of God in the book of John, the first two chapters, it says Jesus is the word of God and through him all things were made and there was nothing made. There was nothing made that did not go through him first. So then all things that do exist, exist through God's word. 
And if all things exist through God's word, God spoke them into being. Do you understand? So then all things came from God. God can do whatever he wants with his creation. But God is perfect. And God cannot lie. It is nowhere near his character to lie. God does not tempt man. It is nowhere near his character to do that. If I created, if I created a species, and I loved that species, I don't want that species to be a robot. If I want them to be my children, I will give them free will. And I will train them in a certain way. And I will let them fall sometimes to teach them things. And I will raise them up because in the end I want them to be my children. I will send them through everything that they may know what I know. That they may be good children. Having what? A child is someone who carries the characteristics of his or her father. Do you understand that? Okay, so... Since you don't understand, I'm glad you said that. We're going to go to John again. John. Can we go to John? Everybody go to John. Let's go to John. So that you really understand this. Whew. God is so good. We're going to read John. You guys ready for this? We're going to read the whole thing of John so that you truly understand this. Can we do that? John 4 1. When therefore the Lord knew. How the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. Jesus did not baptize, but his disciples did. And they heard that Jesus baptized more than John did. Right? He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called... Uh, uh, um, what is that? Sachar, near to the parcel of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, that means tired of the flesh because he was in the flesh. He was also prone. He was prone to all things of the flesh, so he understands what being wearied is. Uh-oh, somebody didn't know that. Jesus wearied? Yes, in the flesh, not in the spirit. Not in the spirit by any means. Let's continue. He sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which, a woman, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. He qualifies the gift of God. If thou knewest the gift of God, if you knew the gift of God, what the gift of God was, you would say to me, Give you something to drink. If you knew the gift of God, which is salvation, you would say, give me salvation. That's what's it. That's a, isn't that what he's saying? That's what he said. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou had nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou the living water? Hmm? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? Here we go. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us a well and drank thereof, himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of the water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. And that thou sayest, Thou truly. The woman said, saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say, 
that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mount nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, it says, you worship ye know not what. Now I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to point out something to you. First of all, a little side note. This woman was shacked up with a guy that was not her husband. And she was married. She had been married five times. Jesus never once condemned her. Did he? Did he condemn her? No, he didn't. He didn't condemn her. Did anybody ever hear a condemnation come out of his mouth concerning her? He did not condemn her. He didn't. I want you to get this characteristic. He didn't condemn her. By what words did Jesus speak? Whatever the Father gave him, Jesus is the mouth of God. He didn't condemn her. He said he only spoke those things the Father gave him. Because he is the word of God made flesh and dwelt among men. Jesus never condemned her. Instead, what did he do? He offered her what he had. You'll hear that over and over and over in the New Testament. Didn't Peter and, and John say, I don't have money. What I do have, I give to you freely. That's what he said. He said, I don't have money, but what I do have, I give to you freely. Hmm? Jesus did not con go around condemning anybody. He didn't. He didn't. You see that? He didn't point out her sin. She told the truth. He confirmed that sin and got on to something else. Right? And worst of all, she was a Samaritan. Full of wicked ways and everything else. <laughs> huh? Okay. Now, Listen, Jesus says at the end, I want, I, that's a side note. I want to give you that, a side note. Jesus proceeds to give her instruction and a prophecy. Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Now that's a strange statement. They won't worship the Father in Jerusalem and they won't worship the Father in that mountain. Why did he say that? Why did he say that? Let, did you hear this? They won't worship the Father in Jerusalem. The hour cometh when it won't happen. They won't worship him. Let's continue. It's, it, Jesus says in 422, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. You guys hear that? What are we defining this? What, what are we defining here? Hmm? Well, many people don't know God is a spirit. Jesus told us to walk in the spirit that we do not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The spirit defined here and all throughout the Bible are the words of God. In the words of God, he told us, out of the mouth, out of your mouth, proceed the issues of the heart. The words of God are his heart. If you walk by the Spirit, you walk by the heart of God. Having the mind of Christ, you walk by the heart of God. And if you walk, if you're in the Spirit, if you worship God in spirit and in truth, you have to walk in the Spirit to do so. And if you do that, guess what? You're going to have characteristics of your Father. Now, I'm going to read something. Can I read something to you? Don't be offended. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it to you. Nobody be offended. Here we go. You guys ready for this? You ready? Because we're, we are we are just we, you, you ready. Okay. All right. Are you guys ready for this? I hope so. The question is, am I ready? Do I have the right scripture? What? Let's see. Let me, let me find some, guys. Hold on. I got to find some. 
Let's see. Well, I didn't do that right. All right. Oh, boy, it's not cooperating. Are you not? What's wrong with you? <sighs> Thank you, Lord. Okay, you guys ready? You guys ready? How many are ready? How many are ready? All right. You ready? John 8. John 8. I'm going to start at 39. Come on, let's read. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. All right? Hmm? Listen, listen what Jesus said before that. Listen what he said. Jesus said, verily, verily, this is John 8.34. We'll start there. Come on, stay with me. John chapter 8.34. Just bear with me. Jesus answered, and, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Now, he said this because he's about to go into something. This was right after he said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Right? Because he said, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. If, that's a condition, if you continue in my word. So that means those who fall away cannot be his disciples. They are not his disciples. If they're not his disciples, then what are they? If a person gives up in the word, then what are they? They're certainly not a student of the word. See, you may not know this, but a disciple, right, is like a, uh, uh, what do you call those things? Uh, the, the folks that step in, come on, my brain is not working, right? It's like an apprentice or student or pupil, right? That's why I always say we have to be a student of the word of God. Well, to be a student of the word of God is to be a disciple which is a pupil of what Jesus said. To be a disciple of Christ is to be a student of the word because Jesus is the word made flesh and dwelt among men. Therefore, to be a disciple is to be a student of the word. To be his student, right? To be his student means to continue in it. Not a student that's going to just shut the whole thing down and drop out of class. That's not a student. Right? That's why he said any man that puts his hand to the plow looking back is not fit for the kingdom of God. They can't be his disciple. Because a disciple is a student that's going all the way. He that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. The same person who endures until the end, that person is saved. Because at the very end is fulfillment. And if you fall away in the middle, you didn't reach fulfillment. Okay. So we get that out of the way, right? He said, Jesus said, Jesus said here, when he was talking about that, Jesus said, if you continue my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So every disciple of Christ is free not bound. He said, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples. Indeed, that means truthfully, 100%, and ye shall know the truth. You will know the truth if you are his disciples. And he says, and the truth shall make you free. That's a, make you free means that truth is going to bust off every chain of bondage in your life. How does that happen? You have to continue in the word of Christ. You, do you see that, folks? You telling me you don't have a purpose? Listen, some of you, th this is what happens when you think you already know. Right? Lord, don't ever put me in that position. Oh, don't I, I know all that. You don't have to talk about that. No, let me hear it again. See, a student of the word of God will always say, let me hear it again. Let me hear it again. I want to hear that one more time because when I heard that the first time and so and so happened and so, only the person who is no longer continuing in the word of God will say, I already know that. Tell me something new. So they begin to crave instantly something else. Hmm? They do. You, and that, that has happened to each one of us. Don't say it didn't happen to you because it did. That we 
caught a brand new craving of something else. We wanted something new. So we drifted off into other things. Don't try to act like you didn't do it because you did. You did it. We all did that. Some of the preachers out there did. Don't let anybody fool you because the preachers do it too. Those who teach, they did it too. They drifted off into something else and had to, somebody caught them and said, hey, what are you doing? Get back over there where you are supposed to be. You're not supposed to be over here. Right? If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free make you free they answered him we be Abraham's seed we're never in bondage to any man did you hear this Isn't that what people say? no man's gonna tell me what to do folks now I hope you're listening to me clearly because you have said this and I asked you in the beginning have you in any way any way form or fashion <laughs> been in service to Lucifer in any way form or fashion of your life or you a servant of Lucifer listen to me the, they said they said they answered him we be we are Abraham's seed we were never in bondage to any man how sayest thou ye shall be made free did you hear that how many people have you heard and they said well I'm not gonna listen to any man no nobody can tell me what to do have you ever heard that Nobody can tell me what to do. Huh? Is that a characteristic of God? No, I don't think so. You're going to be sick. Now, don't, don't, don't be sick of yourself. You, listen, I'm telling you now, I'm giving you a warning. After we get finished with this in the next 10 minutes, you understand it. Those of you who are convicted by it, don't let it go. Say, uh-uh, Lord, I'm taking this for you. And you begin to thank the Lord for showing you in the first place. Because if you're not shown a thing that's working in your life, you're going to keep that thing, and it's going to eat you from the inside out. It's going to tear your whole life down. And you can forget that dream you have in your head called the fulfillment of God's word. God will make things known to you that you may repent. That's why they're made known to you, that you may repent. And that happens in spurts of time because he gave us what time to repent and to reflect. So you should say, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for your long suffering to us. And that's why you didn't perish. You thought you were ready to go stand before the Lord. You are not ready to go stand before the Lord. Or you would be standing before the Lord. They answered and said, we, we are Abraham's seed. They think I have an attitude. We are Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How, do you, how are you going to say we're going to be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Hmm? Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. Now, you won't highlight this. You can't shake and bake this any other way. There's nothing you can do to this statement to alter it, to make it uh, comfortable for yourselves, and that's why most people skip over it or don't read it at all. Or they'll say, well, what Jesus was trying to say, no, he just said. And he put the old verily, verily in front of it, as Tatum would say, the old verily, verily, right, in front of it. He said, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. And then we ask, I asked you, are you in any way, form, or fashion serving Lucifer? Hmm? Any way, form, or fashion, are you serving Lucifer? Listen, and, and John 8, 35, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. He, so he's, he says, whoever commits sin is a servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever. This is a good thing for you. He said, but the Son abideth ever. Why did he just say forever? 
Why didn't he just say for? He said the son abideth ever. That word ever used in this context means now, did, and will in the future. Forever it was normally used it, it, implying, implying a determined purpose in one way, right? Ever means right now also. Forever is pointing to something in the future. Ever means right now too. Do you see the difference? Forever means something down the road, right? Ever means right now, yesterday, and in the future. That's what it means. All right? He said, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed right now and forever. Right now at this moment you're free and forever you're free. That's what he's saying. That's, that's what's being said. He said, I know that you're Abraham's seed. This is what Jesus is saying. I know you're Abraham's seed. No, this is a big one. But you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. Now, now stop. We've got to stop. He said, I know you're Abraham's seed, but he says, you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. Whose word did he speak? God's word. Listen, John 8, 38. He says, I speak that which I have seen with my father. And you do that which ye have seen with your father. Hmm? He already knew they were seeds of Abraham. He said that. Listen to what he said in 837. I know that you're seeds of Abraham. I know that you're offspring of Abraham. He said, but you seek to kill me. So I'm not talking about Abraham. Uh-oh, you see that? That's why he put the but there. Why would somebody say, I know you're seeds of Abraham. He said, but you seek to kill me. Why did he use the word but? A clause. Why did he do that? Why did he put that big clause in there? But you seek to kill me. Because my word had no place in you. So he's not going to, he, know, he already knows they're Abraham's seed. But he's not talking about Abraham. He said, I speak, Jesus says, I speak that which I have seen in my father. And you do that which you have seen with your father. He's not speaking about Abraham. He's not speaking about They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. See, pious, dodos. Jesus answered, Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me. A man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This didn't, Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then say they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? He says, Even because ye cannot hear my word, ye are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father ye will do. Now pay close attention. He was a murderer from the beginning. Now Jesus just kept saying, you're trying to kill me. You're trying to kill me. I know you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me. I know you're Abraham's seed, but you are doing the deeds of your father. And it's not Abraham. Abraham didn't do the deed you seek to do. But your father is the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. Stop. What in the world does that mean? So many people have skipped over this. It says, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, there's a colon right there. He speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. What does that mean? There's no way in the world you can skip over this. So what did Jesus say? Now see, this is where it comes in. They sought to kill Christ. It was in them to do that. What was Jesus saying? They sought to kill him because they were doing the works of their father. The same, the same attributes of your father 
is what you do. Listen to me close. If you have a habit of accusing other people, you get that from your father. I'm not talking about your earthly father. You will serve and to do in this earth those things characterized by your father, whoever that may be. God is a God of love. Who is the devil? Hmm? He walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know? He's a thief. He's a murderer. He is the opposition to God's word. He is a devourer. He's a king of a kingdom of demons, of wicked ones and mischief and lies, murderous spirits of infirmities and everything else. He falsely accuses. He slanders. Listen, slandering and false accusation is also murder. When somebody out there in the world who is in the body of Christ says to themselves, and they start throwing accusations at another preacher, what are they doing? They're not telling the truth. Satan's truths are always mixed with a lie, and that's what makes him the father of lies. He did the same thing in the garden. But when he speaketh a lie, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own? Why? I'll tell you why. Who do the kingdoms of this earth belong to? God or Satan? Who do they belong to? And if they belong to God, then why in Revelation does it say the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God? And why in the world in Daniel does it say the everlasting kingdom will come in? God's kingdom. So Satan has these kingdoms. How, does, how is he lord over this world? How is he the prince of this world? Because this world is made up of things made of man, influenced by Satan. Satan built these kingdoms through mankind who was not with God. If you are not serving your Father in heaven through Jesus Christ, you are of a you are in servitude to a different father that you have. And the only way you can serve Christ is through the Spirit. Just like you, you must worship God in spirit and in truth. There is no gray area. They could not hear nor comprehend what Jesus said. Can't you understand what I'm saying? Why do you not understand my speech? He said, even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil. And listen, he says, the lust of your father you will do. The desires of your father you will do. I ask you this, what do you desire to do? See, all people, this is why gee, God said, vengeance is mine. Because if you seek revenge... You're seeking to slander. You're seeking to accuse. You're seeking to oppose God's word by way of simply wanting revenge. You want someone to be judged, but you don't want God to judge you. Satan is also called the adversary. What is an adversary? An adversary is the opposer of God's word. So if he opposes God's word where God uses love, Satan will oppose it utilizing something else. But what he uses he has established in this earth. So he utilizes men's kingdoms to go against the nature of God in this world. Do you understand that? When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. What does that mean? That means he's speaking Of his own things. Of himself. Who is he? He is the prince of this world. If he is the prince of the world and the kingdoms are his. Then he has influenced mankind to build these kingdoms. They are not God's kingdoms. That's why they are full of violence. That's why they can never be fixed. That's why they really can never be fixed. These kingdoms cause people to take oaths. Jesus said, don't you ever take an oath. 
never take an oath. Yet these kingdoms, I took an oath. I took an oath. Why would a kingdom teach something in defiance of Christ? Because they belong to Satan. That's why. I won't take another oath. I will not. I don't care where it comes from. The Lord said, don't you make an oath by anything. To swear means take an oath. Don't swear by anything. Not even the hairs on your head. What does the world teach? Oh, take this oath. You even have people saying, oh, we need people to take an oath. No, I'm not taking an oath because that's in defiance of Christ. Why would a Christian ask me to take an oath of anything when it was said, don't take an oath? And why would you not take an oath? Because you're not taking it to the kingdom. You're not taking that oath for the kingdom of God. You're taking the oath. Why would Jesus say that in the first place? Because any oath you make that's in this world is for Lucifer, not God. It does not matter what it looks like. You see, Satan appears, he often appears as an angel of light. He is a seducer. His kingdoms may look righteous, but they are of him. I hope you understand that. So guess what? Yours, our servitude to these systems are actually what? We made a mistake. We are to bring in the everlasting kingdom. We are to be subservient to the kingdom of God. We are to intercede for the kingdoms of this earth and the people in the kingdoms of this earth. Not the kingdoms, the people of the kingdoms of this earth. They oppose God. Look into the kingdoms yourself. Look at the laws. Do they not oppose God? Stop looking for the big things. Is Jesus posted in America all over the White House and everything else? No. No matter who goes in there, you won't see that. You see, in God we trust, or something like that. You, you didn't qualify God. You can't trust in God because you can't get to God unless you go through Christ. You don't know what God they're talking about, but I do. I know exactly what God they're talking about. Why do you think Paul called Lucifer the God of this age? That word age implies the system made by men influenced by him the God of these systems my my and then you wonder why people are going to take the mark of the beast and then you wonder why in Revelation it says they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast you can't see the dragon they worshipped Lucifer that old serpent called the devil the serpent of old is the first serpent in the garden according to the Bible the serpent of old the devil S Lucifer Satan Beelzebub Belial whatever you want to call him And they worship him too. Why? How, do, how does one worship Lucifer? They worship him because they build these kingdoms and they cause people to worship these kingdoms not knowing they were influenced by the dragon, but they're always against God. Then you even had, which people think is a good idea, separation of church and state because they redefine church that they may have a state. That they may run their kingdoms, not according to God, but according to flesh. There is a way that seems right unto man, but it's not. Hmm? Is that hard to swallow? See, you know there's some truth in this. But you can't swallow it. All of you can't swallow it. You're like, oh, I, I, I can't quite swallow that one. Why not? What's fighting it? What is fighting it? See, because you come down to a choice. Either you serve the kingdom of God, which is nothing in this world, or you serve the kingdoms of this world. Which one is it? See, that's the choice nobody wants. You don't want that choice. Why? Because the same person that does not want that choice is not ready to surrender all things of their life in the first place. Hmm? Let me give you an example of not surrendering something. If I were to argue with someone proving my point, I have not surrendered fully to the Most High. 
Because the Lord said, don't enter into such conversations. I'm not going to argue about the word of God. He also said, a fool is right in his own mind, and a fool is someone who defends a falsehood. It's foolish to do so, and they're always going to be right, and you're going to lose. Because if you're truly of God, you're going to be humble. With the characteristics of God, which is love. God is love. Love will be in you. You will have and will fulfill the lusts or the desires of your father. What is God's desire? I'll tell you what it is. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever shall believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. His desire is that all men be saved. He is, he is not slack concerning his promises as men count slackness but as long suffering to usward. He does not want us to perish. That is the desire of our father. Is that desire in you? Can you really look around your household and your neighborhood and everything else and, and really look at them and you don't want any of them to perish? Because if God is your father, that desire is in you too. You will have the desires of your father. Now you can identify what is ruling your life, flesh or spirit. Because in your spirit you have that desire, but in your flesh you do not. In your flesh you have revenge. In your flesh you have accusation. That is one of the big ones. If you so much as talk about somebody else's error, and you don't know the whole story of that error you're falsely accusing. Why? Because you don't have all the facts. It's impossible for you to... And one fact you need is what was that person's condition of the soul during the time they did it. You have to have those facts. You can't have just physical facts. You need spiritual facts too. So to accuse a person of just physical things concerning the totality of that individual is in a falsehood. You can only, you can only, you can only point out those things you can see. But the majority of the nature of man is what you can never see. It is on the inside. So then if you accuse based on your sight, guess what you falsely accuse? Somebody could say, if I was a student in a classroom, that I raised my hand at the wrong time. Somebody else who was sitting beside me would say, no, he had a spider crawling up his arm, and it almost bit him. And he raised his arm up to shuck it off. Now, that explains why I did it. But the person who accused me had no cause for me doing it. They didn't look beyond the fact that I raised my hand. Did they falsely accuse me of doing something? Yes. They said, he raised his hand, and, and implying he purposely did this out of time. And they could throw stuff to it, just like Lucifer does. He raised his hand out of time so that he could beat everybody else, and he adds lies to the story. So he tells the truth, adds a few lies, and before you know it, you have drama. He is the father of lies. God does not accuse. God came and sent his son to forgive. <laughs> Satan accuses, God forgives. My goodness. See, people don't like that because you may look at a person and say they need to pay for their wrongdoings. That's not your call. See, that's murder. And Satan was a murderer from the beginning. That's murder. When you look at a person and say, they need to pay for this or that, so do you. Well, they hurt that person. Well, you defied your own creator. What did Jesus say? Pull that, little, pull that thing out of your own eye. Folks, you see where I'm going with this. What does this expose our true servitude by way of what desires? Now you can see what's ruling your life. Had the Pharisees listened to Jesus in this, they could have repented. They could have said, Lord, forgive us. Yes, our desires are wrong. Save us. And Jesus would have saved them. That's all they had to do. But they didn't do that. What did they do? They defended themselves. They defended. They didn't surrender. They defended themselves. They defended their point of view. That's what they did. How many times have we done the same thing? Somebody gets to us, and then we defend our point of view. And when we defend our point of view, we're actually defending the lusts of Lucifer himself. See, that's what you don't understand. So guess what? We have been in servitude to Lucifer. And now it's time 
not to be. To recognize it and not to be. The key thing here tonight is that you will, you will do, you will do the desires of your Father. You will do them in this earth, the desires of your Father. And the question is, who is really your Father? We may claim a Father by mouth, but our deeds show who our Father really is. You see? You see? And, and, and when you have a time like this for repentance, to realize something of this nature, that truth will make you free. This entire chapter in John 8, right? This chapter in John 8 is showing you this. That many operate. Their, their true father is in their flesh and it is shown for what it is. All too often we defend it, not surrender it. And we won't repent. We reply defensively. But when you see something like that of your flesh, it is so easy to say, Lord, I lay it down before you. I want to get, listen, I've got beyond laying down before the Lord. Lord, destroy it, and I forbid it to come back first. While he is destroying it, I will not do it. You see, the Bible says, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Well, guess what? I don't want anything in between me and my Savior. I don't want anything between us. If something rises unpleasing to him, I will throw it out as soon as I see it. I don't want it. I don't care what it is. I don't want it. Because I know this. If something is between me and my Savior, because I do in fact love you, I cannot help you. And that would break my heart. It's okay to say that, men. That's a fact. It is the truth. My entire existence truly depends upon me doing something for my fellow man. I, did, I would not want to live if I could not do anything for my fellow man. That's a fact. That's a truth. I desire no life if I can't do anything for my fellow man, period. Period. When you know these things, when you identify these things, it begins. It begins. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How many people did not know some of these things we discussed tonight? Better yet, how many people knew them but never looked into them? Therefore, it didn't stick in your mind. But now you can see the truth. That yes, you've been in servitude to Lucifer in certain areas and aspects of your life. And yes, it requires repentance. How many people can see that? Folks, I didn't bring that forward. If, you, if it was just for one or two, so be it. I didn't bring this forward. These are not my words. These are the words of Christ. We have read these things so many times. And have skipped over them. Why? Because we had an agenda to speak about something else. But when you're led by the Holy Spirit, something different happens. The truth comes forward. And, and what the Holy Spirit gives is never wrong. Hmm? He is making known the world of sin. And we need the world of sin in our own personal lives to be made known to us. That we may fall to our knees, surrender it, and repent of it. And be washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. See, because I can't feel clean in the blood of the Lamb if I know I have sin in my life somewhere. I don't, I don't want that. No, no. I need to see these things. So I often say, Lord, show me. And he does. And he prepares me. And they manifest and, and I get rid of them. I don't want them. And so he shows those things you truly don't want by the heart. But we all must remember, we do those things. We do the desires of our Father, which is either God the Father or Lucifer, the devil. 
those who are in sin. And that's why he said, that's why he said, he said, whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. Hmm? He said, if we continue in his word, then we are his disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Because if you continue in his word, you're going to continue to be refined. You're, you, you will continue to repent and not do the deeds or fulfill the lusts of your father, which is the first was the devil. He bought us from death to life. Inherently, from way of your flesh, the devil was all in you. Just like a child's heart is full of folly. So who's in the flesh of a child? Who's in that heart of a child? Hmm? See, there's no in-between. We have been sometimes following some sort of doctrine of imagination. And now we see. Can some of you see this? Did this make clear several aspects to you? Like that the comforter could not come unless Jesus left. Hmm? Isn't that very simple? Isn't that, isn't that very simple? Why you are ambassadors to Christ? Because the Spirit was sent in his name. Like that you do the deeds of your Father. Whether that be of God the Father or of the devil. You can't get around that. These things are important. That we may repent in truth. I encourage all of you to take, uh, uh, to, to go back into John and read it. Both chapters, read them. Read them. The 16, John 16, John 8, read the whole thing if you can. Read them, know them. Know what adversary is. He opposes God in all things. So if you carry anything of God, Satan will oppose it. But I wanted to share one last thing to you, so I'm going to go ahead and burst it out. Because we talked about King Nebuchadnezzar, and a lot of people think that these kingdoms of this world are totally out of control. They are not. God permits them to exist. He takes no pleasure in these kingdoms. He said... To love the world is to have enmity with God. Did, wasn't that written in the word? If you love the world, you love Satan's handiwork. You love your father, the devil, if you love the world. If you love God, you will not love the world. And the love of the world will not be in you. You will not love the world. See, I'm proving this point that Satan truly is the God of this world because the kingdoms of him, he calls mankind. He is the God of this world. The world means the God of men. Men made the stuff in this world. When you speak of that term world, it should be he is the God of these systems in the earth. He is the God of the systems in the earth because mankind makes systems. And they worship these systems. They have become idols. And Satan is behind it. They have fulfilled the lusts of their flesh. Satan is the author of these. He is the, the, the one who bestowed to mankind the system. That's also in the book of Revelation. Which is why the dragon gave the beast his power seat great authority. Because he copied himself in the earth. He made a physical manifestation of himself, his architecture, and everything else in the earth. Just like Jesus has conformed us to himself and poured the Holy Spirit within us. So Satan copycatted the same thing. He made a copy of himself in the earth called a beast system. And the people constitute that system. And he gave that system, the people, his power seat and great authority. Just like God gives us of his spirit in the earth. See how he mimics and copycats and opposes everything God does. He is your adversary. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. He's doing that already. You just couldn't see it. Can you see it now? I got to go before I go into another two hours of that.
Mm-mm-mm. Folks, we'll get back to this conversation. Lord willing, tomorrow, well, let's see, what, what is tomorrow? Is tomorrow the, the uh, uh-oh, nope, nope, we're going back to the other exposure. See, Wednesdays, 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 what's wrong with me, Angela? Stop laughing. Wednesdays, I'm reserving for our, we were having a discussion, right? We were having a discussion of the fugitive declassified. So we're going to continue that tomorrow, okay? The second agenda. We talked about the first agenda. We're going to talk about the second agenda tomorrow. All right? But don't, don't be shocked if I come on tomorrow morning. All right? Because in the a.m. hours, I'm going to start doing broadcasts. In the a.m. hours. So that, that's like a double shift. That's a double shift. There's, it, it, because I'm, I need to squeeze in some things into some broadcasts and get them archived. It's not entertainment. This is not entertainment. It is not. It will go hand in hand in tandem with the site. And believe me, we are working hard. No, you can't see too many things up there. Because we're fighting like you wouldn't believe to go forward. But we're going to continue the fight and we're going to go forward. But I'll be doing it probably two broadcasts per day. And some recordings for the radio stations. We have to do one more for them. That makes a total of, that makes a pretty big total. And then they air. So we'll have the station lists right to put on the site and i'm sure that people will go up there and, and uh, um, go visit and go talk go do whatever go dig investigate do whatever they have to do so be it so be it folks edify one another with the gospel of jesus christ in the truth only <clears throat> i hope this helps you tonight because we'll, we will no doubt talk about this tomorrow morning if I come on air. We'll complete it because it's not complete. It is not complete. So I may come back tomorrow morning as I did this morning and finish this out. All right? And if I do, it'll be around 10.30 Eastern Standard Time tomorrow morning. 10.30 Eastern Standard Time, okay? God bless each and every one of you. I'm going to flip to Larry real quick. Larry, go ahead and cue your, well, he's in, he's not there, he's in surgery. So, I gotta go, I have to go. The system may go blank, but I wanna say God bless each of you. I may be in the chat room later on, maybe, possibly. We'll see. God bless each of you. <laughs>